Welcome to the Land Geek Podcast, your resource for information and tips to making money by buying and selling land. Let the Land Geek show you how to make a passive income by working smart, not working hard. Learn strategies and tricks to make money buying and selling raw land today. And here is the man that's going to help you do that, the Land Geek. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And today, I hope you're ready because this guy is a rock star in a niche that is really near and dear to my heart only because of the issues that you don't have to deal with, like with myself with land. You completely avoid the three T's in his niche. No tenants, no termites, no toilets. Let's add another one, four T's and no trash. So he is known as the leading expert, the nation's, the world's leading expert for all things, that's right, self-storage. It's probably a niche you're not that familiar with. I'm not that familiar with. A formerly near bankrupt landlord who invested in a small self-storage facility and then saw the light sold off all his assets only to invest in self-storage. I am pleased and honored to introduce today on the Land Geek Podcast from Indianapolis, a fellow Hoosier, Scott Myers. Scott, how are you? Hey, I am fantastic, Mark, and that is probably the most uh, exciting or excited uh, uh, announcement uh, to a podcast, uh, an, an introduction to me that I've ever had, so I appreciate that. I needed that right about now. That's right. That's right. See, this is this is the kind of intro you get after a grande Americano <laughs> Starbucks. Love it. Yep. Pre, Pre-Americano would have been Scott Myers, self-storage expert. Yep. <laughs> Un- understood. I am very well caffeinated as well, so I'm looking forward to this. Great. Great. All right. So, Scott, tell me what's what's going on. Why self-storage? What's how, How'd you get into this niche? Uh, oh, my gosh. How much time do you have here? Do you want the 60-second version or the two-hour version? Let, let's go with the five-minute version. Yeah, the five-minute version. All right. Yeah. So, um, gosh, like uh, I, I guess many folks uh, look to get into real estate for all the reasons we invest in real estate. You know, we have... Uh, hopefully passive income when we get into it, but we can leverage money. In other words, borrow money from banks or other places to buy this investment. You can't do that with stocks. You can't do that with gold. Uh, People, if you rent out the real estate, people pay down the basis. They pay off your mortgage for you. And if it cash flows in the meantime, that's even better. But then once it's, they're all totally paid off, then yeah, you've got yourself a nice, you know, the goose that lays the golden egg. Plus, it depreciates for tax purposes as well. So, I mean, the formula for real estate is fantastic. Uh, but what, what I found is uh, I got myself into the side of uh, rental real estate and single family homes, like where most people start. And I was doing it on the side. I had a full time job. I was doing this as, as kind of a supplement to my retirement. I worked for a Fortune 500 telecom firm and started buying up rental houses after reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad and, and found it, it was doing well in the beginning. I'd buy a house or two. And rehab them, refinance, pull some cash out, and go out and buy two or three more. Sure. And I had uh, a couple hundred bucks positive uh, um, cash flow on each one of those properties. But what I found very quickly is that you know you have one vacancy in, in, in a single family house in a year, and it wipes out pretty much all of the profit by the time you pay to get them out. You know they're they're behind you know thirty to sixty days in rent. They've trashed the place. Uh, you have to. You wait another thirty days or so before you advertise and market to try to find another tenant. They were doing about, on average, thirteen to fifteen hundred dollars worth of just you know damage, let alone wear and tear, just to repaint carpet and all you know turn those things around. Right. And um, it, so I thought that okay, well, I just need to be hard, work harder and smarter about this. And I was in the beginning, I was I was actually making pretty decent money and um, went went into the business as a full time investor. And uh, thought, well, I could probably make a difference if I ramped this up to 40 hours a week. Well, 40 hours turned into 60 hours, and, and the cash flow still wasn't there. And so I thought, all right, well, I, I can get smarter by investing in apartments and uh, take advantage of the economies of scale. And uh, that that didn't really work either. You know, they, uh, a wise man once said that um, you know the uh, uh, the definition of schizophrenia is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result and that's what I got right uh, um, I, I just I bought apartment complexes and started investing in those thinking that uh, cash flow and appreciation would catch up and yeah all I did was buy more tenants and toilets and so we well, were at the place um really the turning point as you have mentioned in the intro uh, where yeah I almost went bankrupt I almost had to give it all up 
and uh, invested in a self storage facility. I, I was determined to stay in real estate, but I thought, how can I? How yeah, can yeah, I? Yeah, but smarter? Scott, what made you think of okay? You know, the 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 tenant thing's not working with single family mm-hmm. homes, apartments. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm I'm familiar with SureGuard Storage and these public companies, and it's mm-hmm. it's phenomenal. But usually, when you think of self storage, you think of the bigger. Oh yeah, national players. Mm-hmm. You don't think of mm-hmm. of individual investors. So what what prompted you to think? Okay, self storage could be a great niche. Mm-hmm. You know, um, well, interestingly enough, you know, obviously my wife was going through this uh, at the same time. Our our tenant and toilet woes and financial woes, and she said, you know, why don't you look into self storage? And at the time, I guess like many other folks, and even some of the students that I talked to, which they think, okay, well, that's you know, that, that's on the opposite end from the trophy properties, like you know, golf courses and resorts, and you know, hotels and office buildings, let alone uh, apartments or single-family homes. And so I, I just never looked into it until we were forced to make a change. So I did. I began doing some research, and and what I found, Mark, is that. Uh, yeah, un- unbeknownst to me, and contrary to, to my beliefs and many others, yeah, this is the the industry is only owned uh, the big guys, the REITs, the real estate investment trust, the public storage, the extra space, you store it, Storage USA. The big guys only own nine percent of the entire industry of all the square footage of all the number of units and facilities out there in the country. They only own nine percent, which means ninety percent of all these facilities nationwide are owned by. Mom and pop, just in, investors, just exactly like me. Every bit is approachable using the same techniques and strategies I was using to buy my homes and single family, or my homes and my small apartment complexes from. So I was uh, pretty shocked to see not only the, the huge opportunity, but also the fact that it's, it's easy enough for anybody, any investor to get into. Scott, I'm blown away that it's it's that fragmented. I, mm-hmm. re- I really thought you were going to say 90% is owned by the public companies and the REITs because they have mm-hmm. so much capital to deploy. They've got to deploy the capital. Mm-hmm. So that is shocking to me. No well, kidding. And so, one would think so that those, as you so, drive down. Yeah. Go ahead. So, I mean, is this mainly in on the fringes of metro areas? Because in the metro areas, it's like in Scottsdale, it just seems like it's all bigger players. Am I wrong? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting. You, you'll, you'll see now, Mark, after our podcast, as you drive around, <laughs> you're going to notice these. They'll be top of mind, and, and you'll notice them everywhere. And so, yeah, the big guys, they own the big flashy ones. You know, the multi-story, they're, they want to be, you know, next to McDonald's and across from Walmart. Right. And they're the very nice uh, facilities. But the ones that are owned by the mom and pops, you know, we're, we're behind the retail strip center. We're in a converted older Walmart or Kmart or other warehouse. We're in the in the primary cities, but on the outskirts or on the areas where nobody else wants to develop, sometimes in older buildings that have been abandoned that we've repurposed and turned around and bought for pennies on the dollar and converted to storage for pennies on the dollar. Um, we're along railroad lines. We're in secondary markets and tertiary markets, um, you name it. The, the thing is, Mark, one in 10 households uses one or more self-storage units, says the Self-Storage Association. So as long as there are people living somewhere, you will find a self-storage facility, big or small, very nearby. Oh, absolutely. I mean, do you ever watch Storage Wars? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable. It's it's a it's a thing. And, yeah. I mean, and you can see on those in that TV show, those those storage companies are not hurting for uh for for space, right? No, no. Well, well, well here's the other thing to to look at. You know, we um, I've seen an awful lot of people. Well, we have we have auctions at our facilities, just like that, and like the show. You know, that's the, the process is the same. Now, a little bit of that is embellished, and uh, hopefully, everybody on your show, I think they're fairly intelligent, Mark, um, uh, and educated enough to know that not all reality TV is is all reality. Right. Of course. Um, wink, wink, intent. Neither is this. So, but what you see on the show, the process is exactly correct. And so when these folks come out there to buy these these units, they go through that same process. But the one thing that I guess folks overlook is, yeah, you can make a little bit of money, but look at half of the folks that break even or don't make any money. But you know who always ends up making the money and doing well? <laughs> the self-storage facility. We're, we're laughing at the bank all the, all, all the way home all the time because, you know, unlike, which is Probably the main reason why I get into this business, Mark, is uh, unlike in the single family and apartment world when somebody moves out and I go to court through eviction court and, and I sue them for you know, $1,000, 1300 $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, or whatever it is they owe me in, in repairs and back rent and damages. Right. I get virtually zero. I mean, almost every time. I have the best collection folks in the industry and very, very rarely 
you know, these folks had ran into financial woes and they left. That's, you know, it can't get blood out of a turnip. Sure. But in, in storage, like you see on the shows, you know what? We have the right, we have the ability by law to lock their stuff up and they can't get at it. And if they still don't pay us, then we get to sell it off. And so in many cases, yeah, the owner, I recoup uh, almost all, if not more than what was owed in back rent and late fees. And that is the game changer, my friend. That is a game changer when you do not have the losses like we have in the tenant and toilet world. That's fantastic. How, I mean, I would think it's a very low percentage that would want to lose their stuff where they would say, Scott, I can't pay for this storage facility anymore. Keep my stuff. Mm -hmm. Is it, it is. Is it 10%? Is it 5%? Is it 20%? You know, here's um, it, it. It varies obviously by demographic and where our facilities are located in location. But uh, you know, we manage our facilities. Um, I, I tell my managers we only want to have five percent of each month's accounts receivable outstanding beyond thirty days. So, in other words, at the end of the month, on uh, day thirty, thirty-one, we only want to have five percent of our folks that are still owe money to us. Right. And um, and so and, and we're usually underneath that. I mean, that's that's kind of the maximum allowable. Alarms start going off if it's any higher than that. Sure. And by that point, the process it takes ninety days for somebody to uh, for us to go to the through the process to then have an auction. And usually within that amount of time, they've come in and they've uh, taken care of the bill, they've done a partial, and we let them move out because we don't want to go to auction if we don't have to. Right, but either way, you know we're we're guarded. Um, it, it it is a small percentage, and we do we hold an auction about once every three or four months, just as we have a handful that need to be done, and we need to free up some units. Uh, but we don't do it every thirty days or so, because most of the time they just don't. And in the instances in which they they don't pay, and um, typically what happens is that they've just you know. They've moved away. They just abandoned. They forgot about it. There's been, you know, a divorce, separation, or or what have you. And and most of the times, um, contrary to what you would see on TV, there's not, you know, ten thousand dollars snap on tool chests and you know antique motorcycles and jukeboxes and coke machines and things like that. You know, we've <laughs> we've got, you know, they owe us one hundred fifty bucks, and we'd be lucky if we get a hundred dollars uh, worth of uh, you know money out of those uh, boxes. But nevertheless, sure. sometimes it's the same. Sometimes it's a uh, you know it's a little bit more. But at the end of the day, it's a great way to manage your your accounts receivable, and our losses are very, very minimal, minimal rent loss in this industry, period. Right. And speaking of management, you're not talking about like you would with, let's say, a management company for managing single-family homes or apartment mm-hmm. buildings. You've got one person there, right? Yeah. You know, we, the, the ratio, I think the last that I've seen, and I used to have my certified apartment manager designation when I was in that, that business, and they uh, they said the rule of thumb was usually one full-time manager for every hundred tenants, right. whether you have a single family operation or a, um, a, a apartment complex. And in storage, it's one full-time manager for every 400. Wow. Because we're not... Well, well, think about it. We're not managing people. You know, we don't have any d- domestic issues. People parking on the lawn, or their dog issues, or fighting with each other, or catching up on rent. I mean, we don't have anything to manage. Just people depositing their stuff there, and we don't see them. You know, they send a check in, or they pay online through their debit or debit or credit card account. And nine, twelve months, or fifteen years later, they'll come get their stuff back out. That's it. There's just nothing or no one to manage. That's fantastic. It's fantastic. So. How difficult is it to find these deals? If I mean, I you know, if you're saying that only nine percent of the REITs and the, mm-hmm. are investing in self storage, that's a huge market. Mm-hmm. Tell tell it me is. a little bit about your portfolio and, mm-hmm. and what's going on with it. Yeah. We've, uh, yeah, well, when I began, um, I did a test. I was sending out mailers. That's still my favorite form. I mean, you, you do the normal things. You, you, you segment your market, determine what your market is. You know, if it's two hours within a drive from my home or my office, you know, Google search and, and look at all the facilities that are in that location. Send some mailers out to the owner. Say, hey, if and when you're interested in selling your facility, I'm an investor and I'd be interested. Give me first crack at it. I'd like to take a look. I'm a serious buyer. I'm not a tire kicker. However, you want to tweak those letters. Sure. We contact the commercial brokers that either specialize in self storage or industrial, or just depending upon our market, just can contact some a couple of three commercial brokers and tell them what you're looking for, and, and say, hey, when when these folks come into the office and they want to uh, sell their self storage facility, you know, keep me in mind. Let me know. I'd love to have first crack at it and have the, the pocket listing, uh, if you will. But uh, either way, uh, you know, put me on your buyers list. 
And then it's networking, letting everybody else know that you're in the business. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a shotgun approach. It's like any other form of real estate. You, know, you just got to go out there and be in your market and talking to the folks that have access. Um, we also, you know, we network with the folks within our self-storage association within the states in which we operate in. And so by word of mouth, I'm, I, I'm in a little different place, obviously. I've been in the industry for a number of years and a, and a national speaker and trainer. So we get a lot of deals that, that come across our desk. Right. And, and I also partner with uh, my students on deals. And so my portfolio is scattered, primarily central Indiana from our efforts over the years. Uh, we just closed a facility in New Jersey. I'm looking at another one in Pennsylvania right now, you know, Texas, Florida. I mean, we'll go anywhere where there's a deal. Um, and then just kind of look at the market to see if it can back up and support that facility, you know, at, if we purchase it um, at the numbers that we've underwritten it at. Sure, sure. Now, how about financing? Is it difficult mm -hmm. to get? Not as difficult as the other asset classes. Self-storage, because of the nature, well, mostly because of what we've talked about so far, there's very few losses, and the industry is just growing at a tremendous pace. Um, Self-storage has the lowest loan default rate of all asset classes in commercial real estate, period. I, I believe it. I think I, I read somewhere that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. it's about a 30% ROI. It, yeah, depending on how you slice it, um, you know, we, we return a little bit more than that to our investors, but we're a little better at this, I think, than most. But uh, yeah, if you're looking at the, the the real estate investment trust, the public companies, and the and kind of the retail type facilities, yeah, yeah. And, and that's nothing to sneeze at. But, no, that's uh, yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a pretty good return, and that's you know, for all those reasons we uh, we love the business. But yeah, the ROI is good. Um, the losses are minimal, so therefore the loan default rates are low. So yeah, banks are. I don't want to say they're climbing over each other, but the you know when we hold our live events, we have a number of of lenders in the industry and the and the big brokers that want to come to our events and, and talk about what they can do because they, we put them in a room full of hungry self storage investors and they want access to them because those are the properties that they want to keep in their portfolio. Right. You know, they take a risk and they need to balance their their portfolio uh, with everything else that they're doing. But this is self-storage is kind of like the anchor for the banker's portfolio. And it could just because it performs, it's very, very predictable. And and um, it, my banker once told me, Mark, he said, um, I was buying one from a bank. It had gone back. And right. it just so happened that um, that investor who had it, he actually had another uh, a few other forms of real estate that tanked and took the self-storage facility into bankruptcy with it. Because I was asking, I said, hey, what happened here? This just doesn't occur very often. He said, yeah, well, you know, you got in trouble in these other asset classes, and uh, you got a good deal here. He said, um, it's a good thing you're in self-storage. He said, a brain-dead brain dead moron can make a million dollars in, in self-storage. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, okay, I'll take that as a compliment, I think. But right. uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, it um, you know, if you mind the store, it, it, it is a pretty good business model, and, and the bankers love it as well, which makes it easier. And private lenders do, too. I mean, private lenders are bankers, and they follow what the bankers are doing, and, and they look at the stats they they've dissected and and they underwrite these deals along with me and so yeah i, I speak at a lot of self-directed ira and other private money events and and yeah i usually get um a big group of people around me at the end after i speak about that topic yeah i'm, I'm i can imagine i can imagine so all right let me ask you this let's mm -hmm. let's take a look at your last deal how yeah. how big was it where did you get it mm -hmm. and um kind of walk us through an actual deal sure yeah, this was a uh, this was a deal that um, two of our, our students found. We are we have a mentoring program, and these two gentlemen were they're, they're the consummate students. It's a student that everybody likes to have, Mark, and that they actually did what we told them to do. And so they I went love out those and, types of students. <laughs> yeah, and, and they're rare and few and far between. Yeah. So these uh, these two partners, uh, they were partner in the real estate business, and uh, they went out and uh, found the self storage facility. It was uh, an expired listing, okay. so they tracked it down, went through the records. They didn't give up there and found the owner of record, which was uh, a bank. So they drove over to the bank and said, "Hey, we found this self storage facility at uh, X Y Z." And um, we're interested in, in buying it. And so talk to the, the loan officer who was in charge of, uh, he, he made the loan originally, and so he was in charge of disposing of the property. Well, they had it listed at a, at a ridiculous price at uh, like $1.2 million. Okay. Um, but the facility had been built for $3.9 million. Now, um, now, so Scott, let me ask you, when you're, when you're mm -hmm. looking at it, are you looking at cap rate? Yeah, yep. We're primarily cap rate buyers for okay. the most part. Yeah, but on, on some of these deals, we're, we're really specializing in buying these distressed properties that get tied up in these bankruptcies, and that's what this one was. Okay. So these guys no negotiated a deal with uh, with the banker, just a phenomenal deal, and they were going to finance it at the time. 
And um, so we were helping the, the, the students through the process. Well, long story short, uh, they were both in the printing business, both living in New Jersey, and Sandy came through and wiped out their printing businesses, the, the companies they work for, literally into the ocean, the buildings and all. That's crazy. It is crazy. So, so they came to me and said, uh, "Hey, we were that that bank was going to loan us uh, the money to buy that facility from them. Uh, they were going to finance it, but now we have no jobs." So they came to me. We put together, uh, con contacted our private lenders, and, and syndicated the deal. And uh, they brought me in as a partner, or I took them on as a partner. However, you want to take a look at it. And sure. uh, we 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 formed a partnership, uh, and then along with our private lenders. And um, closed on the deal, and now we're in the process of uh, leasing it back up and putting our marketing plan in place, rebranding it, and things are trudging along. That's fantastic. So how, how big a facility was it? Yeah, this was, um, you could call it a, a bite-sized deal. It's uh, 39,000 square feet, uh, 230 units. Um, the value when we're done with it, when it's uh, stabilized, will be somewhere in the $2 million range. That's, that's not bad. That's mm -mm. not bad. So, Scott, are you primarily buy and hold? Or do you do a combination of buy and flip and buy and hold? I mean, are you primarily in, mm -hmm. you know, are you, are you saying, look, this is a great cash flowing way of creating passive income, or you can also generate short term gains by buying flipping or, I mean, what, what do you typically preach? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I learned I've been investing for over 20 years now and um, started out kind of following the Carlton Sheets model. You know, you buy 15 homes and or you buy 30 homes over the years and you sell 15 and pay the other 15 off and live off of those. So I, I, I was always in the buy and hold uh, mode. But uh, over the years, I've been through a number of uh, recessions and investment cycles now, and 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 we're we're paying attention much more closely. I, I follow I follow the the money. I, I I look to see what the markets are doing. I look to see what global markets are doing, and uh, we invest uh, dependent upon election cycles. And so nothing is long term anymore. I mean, of all the asset classes, you know, it's nothing's easy. Let's face it. I'm not here to tell you and your folks that uh, this is an easy business, but it's right. certainly easier than all the other forms of real estate that I've invested in. Right. But at the end of the day, there's there's work. It's not a set it and forget it type business. And so we just, we, we mind our store, we mind the markets, and we mind what's going on within the financial markets and, and the economy and, and elections. And so our, our deals primarily now are syndicated. We, we like to pay cash, and so we use private lenders, private money for that instead of the banks. Okay. And so we're usually looking, our investors want um, uh, no longer than a five-year turnaround. So at that point, we'll... Our exit strategy will be either to sell um, and everybody cashes out or some of the partners, including myself, may buy out the other private investors. It really just depends. Um, and it also depends on how much value we've created and if we have the ability to do so. Okay. So we're, we're kind of all across the board, but um, nothing over five years uh, at this point. And quite honestly, if you look at over the years, the buy and hold strategy versus buy, create a ton of value and then sell and then recapitalize and, and go out and do it again. You know, as long as I've got air in my lungs and the ability to go out and do this, that, that is the quicker way to more wealth than just the buy and hold. And you know, graphs and charts will show that and prove that all day long. Right, right. And I would think, you know, as far as a recession-proof type model, wouldn't self-storage mm -hmm. fit in that asset class as opposed to apartment buildings or typical commercial real estate and single-family homes? I mean, mm -hmm. people always have to have somewhere to put their stuff. Yeah, and when you're, it is. And if you're downsizing, you got to put your stuff somewhere, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, if you've heard me say uh, once, you'll hear me say a dozen times. You know, that's the beauty of self storage because there's literally just you know endless uh, reasons to love this industry, and that that is another one of them that you hit on is uh, it's it's essentially recession proof and inflation proof because when times are good, you know what do we do in this country and elsewhere? You know, woo, we. we Glad that recession's over. Let's go buy a bunch of stuff and celebrate. And that's that's right. what we do. You know, we are the hyper consumers in in the world economy, and so we have a lot of stuff. Our houses are double the size they used to be back in the forties and fifties. Uh, we have two and a half, three car garages. We have full basements, and we still don't have room for our stuff. And so yeah. that's that's just what we do. And then when times are bad, there's no development, so there aren't any more new units coming online. And you couple that with the fact that yeah, businesses are downsizing individuals and couples and families are downsizing moving back home moving in with each other and uh, there's a there's still a lot of stuff that won't fit that they don't want to get rid of and even though they gave up a, a $800, $1,200, $1,500 a month housing payment 
you know, for 50, 100, 150 bucks, they can store their stuff that they don't want to get rid of for the time when they're able to go back into a larger home or purchase a home again or when business starts back up again. So it, it actually is one of the few businesses that uh, we, we do better during the recession. The, the storage industry actually occupancy wise it goes up it skyrockets because there's less development and uh, we just have this huge absorption absorption and then therefore goes uh, the you know the law of supply and demand and revenues and margins go up as well so during a recession it's a good place a good asset class to be in and, and it also is during uh, inflation and even a hyperflationary mode I love it I love it so all right we're at that point in the podcast where I'd love to put you on the spot sure and uh I want to know, what is your tip of the week? My tip of the week. Let's see. What you know, you, I'll, yeah, I'll, go ahead. I'll tell you what. Um, this is more of a tool or, or I guess, a resource. Um, it's one called Fancy Hands. Are you familiar with it? I am familiar with Fancy Hands. I am. Oh. You know what's funny about it? I've never used it, but I've, I've looked mm-hmm. into it. So go now, ahead and tell us what about Fancy Hands. Well, I've been using virtual assistants for years now, you know, after reading Tim Ferriss's four hour work week and, uh, and I have virtual assistants doing things for me and, and fancy hands is, I guess it's just another version of that. But a, a buddy of mine turned me on. He said, Hey, you know, why don't you go get onto fancy hands for 25 bucks a month? You think you could get, um, random tasks done. I forget, I, I forget how many tasks I get done now. And uh, just any type of request. Uh, here, here's the rule of thumb that I have, Mark. Right. Um, it, it, Friend of mine told me this a long time ago. I said, "You know, when do you turn this o- something over to a VA?" And uh, he said, "My rule of thumb is if I spent 15 minutes trying to figure it out or get something done, and it's not in my skill set, something I need to learn, or it's just draining, and I'm getting frustrated." He said, "Then I will take the next 10 minutes and explain what I want to have done to a virtual assistant or my own virtual assistant, and have them do it and offload it." And so that's that's kind of the litmus test for me is if it's something that that either my day is just so packed or I'm just looking at something thinking uh, this is going to take me longer than that, or if I get into it and it's 15 minutes, I'll offload it. Right. And so I'll you know, fancy hands is, is well, just what for was that. the last thing you used fancy hands for? I'm just curious. Um, it was research on a property that I found. Um, believe it or not, we were on our way down to Florida, and we stopped off at a uh, stopped off at, a, at an exit. Went to a CVS pharmacy, and uh, I'm just a, a self storage junkie. And so I, I saw this facility nearby, and it looked like it was older and distressed, and a lot of doors up and vacant. So I grabbed the number. I didn't want to mess around with it at the time. And so when we got back from vacation, I couldn't find much information on it. I called the manager off that number, and she wouldn't give me any seller's information. So I, I went off to Fancy Hands. I said, give me the owner of record for this property here. And they went and found it, got the owner of record, and I sent the mail, my mailers off to them. And I just did that like three days ago. And so uh, we'll see if I get uh, a response back from that. But just that to all kinds of personal things. I was going to buy a new cruiser, a bike online. Right. And I had them find that for me. You know, the what here's the parameters that I wanted. I mean, just y- you name it. Um, are personal they, are they to US business. Based, Scott? You know, I don't know. I haven't dug into them enough to know the. I haven't talked to them because that's not the way the service works. But the English, you know, again, I've worked with a lot of VAs from Philippines and India and other places, and and the written responses I get leads me to believe that they're that they're U.S. based. But I don't know yeah. that for certain. I think they are all U.S. based. Man, well, they all um, they respond. You know, a different person every time. It's not anybody dedicated, so I really don't know. But they're all very prompt, and they go over and above. I mean, we even had somebody find us a, a place for dinner on vacation. Hey, go find the number one spot in this city to go out to eat and make us a reservation at next time and done. And so we just go off on an adventure and, and it was just phenomenal. My, so, my, my wife needs fancy hands. Oh, everybody needs fancy everyone hands. Everyone needs fancy hands. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. Well, great. Okay. So for my tip of the week is going to be mm-hmm. somewhere along the same route as far as VA management. Yeah. And it's going to be onlinejobs.com. PH and online jobs mm, mm-hmm. PH can compete with Odesk and Elance and uh, all these virtual assistant sites, but it only focuses on the folks in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. And a bunch of my students are having great success with online jobs that PH. So check it out. And not that there's anything against any of the other countries, but for whatever reason, the Philippines, these people have speak really good English and they're very mm-hmm. tech savvy and they have good uh, internet over there. Um, yep, they do. Very um, well is a reliable compared to more reliable compared to other places. You're, you're right. They are taught English, uh, but also the work, the work ethic and, and um, their oh, desire to, to please is a little different than other places. And so all our VAs right now are from the Philippines. We don't have anybody unless it's just a one-off project. Um, they're all located there. So uh, yeah, good choice. Yeah. Yeah. So Scott, 
any last comments before we we end? Yeah, I guess uh, that it, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but uh, you know, there's there's so much information out there. You know, what should I do? Should I go buy rental houses? I've heard that that's now hot, but the bubble's going to burst, so maybe I shouldn't. Um, land sounds great, but I've heard these bad things about it. And you know, it's, uh, self storage sounds fantastic, right. but I've bought all these other courses and all these other things. I don't have time to learn a new science. Well, you know what? Find what you're passionate about. Something that you know the next day you're still excited about because it makes sense, and then go learn you know, what you need to know enough to pull the trigger, and then pull the trigger, take action. Um, most of what I do, and, and I imagine it's the same for you, Mark, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, people just have this underlying fear right now and they just won't go out and do anything and make it happen. Yeah, you know? yeah, ab yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got to take action. And, yeah. I, and I say this to my students all the time, how many offers did you make today? Mm -hmm. How many offers did you make this week? If you're not making offers, you're not really doing, you're not really in the business. No, it's a hobby. It's yeah. a hobby. And, and I've never bought a facility, Mark, that I didn't first place an offer on it. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's just a numbers game. If you mm -hmm. make 100 offers, something's going to come up that's going to be great. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be able to, uh, to invest in it. So Scott Myers, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. You know what? We're going to have a, uh, a training webinar with Scott. And I'm going to link to the webinar so you can learn a lot more detail than what we've discussed today about how Scott actually does this and it's going to be really really eye opening so I'm really excited about it and Scott I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to be on the webinar or not to be on the webinar but be on the podcast are you going to come back oh absolutely absolutely looking forward to it I love to talk about this stuff it's just a great biz alright great so I will have a link for uh, everyone to learn more, get on the training webinar and uh, and do that. Now, in the meantime, if self-storage isn't your thing and land is, go to www.thelandgeek.com and download the Passive Income Blueprint. Get the ebook, How to Avoid the Three Fatal Land Buying Mistakes, and of course, get this always informative and engaging podcast delivered each week to your email inbox. And look, if you're looking for some wholesale property, give me some love. Go to www.frontierpropertiesusa.com. We're always having uh, new inventory in that uh, on that site, and um, so check it out. So Scott, thanks again, and I want to thank all the listeners for taking time out of your busy days to learn more about investing in self storage as well as raw land. And we'll see everybody next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Land Geek. Join us next time for more tips, secrets, and information that will help you succeed. Stay connected with The Land Geek on Facebook at facebook.com slash thelandgeek.